Welcome to the Ocean's Dying episode of Flip the Planet. I'm Sean Walsh, and in each episode of Flip the Planet, we are going to do our best to clearly define some of the most challenging issues facing our generation, and then provide you with ways you can get involved and make a real difference. In this episode, we're going to discuss the death of our world's oceans. The classic sci-fi film Soil and Green said it all 35 years ago, the oceans are dying. If the oceans die, how long do we have? Today, we take seafood for granted, but unless our generation acts now, seafood may disappear by the year 2050. Research has found that the loss of marine biodiversity is tightly linked to declining water quality, harmful algal blooms, ocean dead zones, fish kills, and coastal flooding. The loss of ocean biodiversity is accelerating, and 29% of the seafood species we eat have already disappeared. If the long-term trend continues, in 40 years, there will be little or no seafood available for sustainable harvest. Here are a few facts about ocean marine life. Since 1950, when industrialized fisheries began to be established, we have rapidly reduced the ocean's resources to less than 10% of their original numbers. Sadly, this is not just the case in some areas, not just for some types of harvested fish, but for entire communities of large fish species. Industrial fishing has aggressively harvested the world's oceans from the tropics to the poles, threatening such species as blue marlin, bluefin tuna, and Antarctic cod to the point of extinction. Evidence of the dramatic decline in marine life is supported by a study of the Japanese longline fishing fleets that fish the entire planet. Longlines consistently catch a wide range of species on the open ocean. They used to catch 10 fish per 100 hooks. Now they are lucky to catch one. There are four important issues related to our oceans dying. First is pollution of the world's oceans. Second is global warming leading to dead zones and dying coral reefs. Third is overfishing on a worldwide scale. And fourth is conservation of marine species. Let's take a closer look at how pollution is playing a part in the poisoning of the oceans and killing sea life. Ironically, as the world consumes ever increasing numbers of fish, most people don't know to what extent the fish on our dinner plate are full of toxins and other pollutants. There have already been public warnings for pregnant women and young children not to eat tuna fish due to the high levels of mercury in canned tuna. An example of how pollution is having a dramatic impact on marine life is in the Gulf of Mexico. Each year, a swath of the Gulf of Mexico becomes so devoid of shrimp, fish, and other marine life that it is known as the dead zone an area with low levels of oxygenated water. This dead zone, which forms each April and lasts through the summer, can span 5,000 to 8,000 square miles. While the pollution that flows into the Gulf of Mexico come from a variety of sources such as wastewater treatment plants, the main source is agricultural runoff, specifically chemical fertilizers and animal manure. To combat the devastation of the Gulf, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in 2001 set a goal of reducing the Gulf of Mexico dead zone to less than 2,000 square miles by this year, 2007. Its plan includes timing of fertilizer applications better, plowing more effectively, restoring natural wetlands, and improving manure management. Scientists have found evidence for more than 100 dead zones worldwide, ranging in size from a half a mile to 27,000 plus square miles. Contributing to the creation of dead zones is global warming. The Great Barrier Reef is the world's largest coral reef, stretching more than 2,300 kilometers along the northeast coast of Australia and is home to over 1,500 species of fish and 400 species of coral. Global warming, however, could cause the Great Barrier Reef to lose 95% of its living coral by 2050 should ocean temperatures increase by the 1.5 degrees Celsius projected by climate scientists. The impact of losing such an important marine life ecosystem would be catastrophic for Australia's tourist economy, not to mention its loss of a major source of fish protein. Scientists have found evidence that dramatically warmer and more acidic oceans 250 million years ago killed 95% of ocean life. The same fate could befall modern day marine life if global warming is not reversed in time. Global warming resulting in the steady rise in ocean temperatures is also contributing to a dead zone of low oxygen water that has been appearing along the Oregon and Washington state coasts each summer since 2002. In both states, people have reported dead rockfish and other bottom fish on beaches. Fishers have found their crab pots packed with dead crabs. So whether global warming is killing the planet's fragile coral reefs or creating low oxygen dead zones where no marine life can survive, 
there is little doubt that rising ocean temperatures as a direct result of global warming are contributing to the death of our world's oceans. Let's move on and discuss how overfishing is impacting our marine ecosystems. The demand for fresh fish in homes and restaurants around the world is soaring at a time when well-established fisheries are becoming exhausted. To meet the demand, fishing boats are venturing into farther reaches of the ocean, guided by high-tech devices, including sonar technology, satellite navigation systems, and depth sensors. Citing the findings of a recent survey of fisheries, the scientists warned that stocks of highly favored fish, such as cod, tuna, haddock, flounder, and swordfish, could disappear from plates within a decade if these species continue to be fished at present levels. The solution to overfishing problem is relatively simple in design, but apparently it is extremely hard to put into practice. In essence, recovery of important species of fish requires that we catch fewer of these fish until they have a chance to recover. By reducing the annual catch by 50%, it would be possible to restore a threatened species. But getting fishermen to cooperate with a fishing moratorium or reduction in catch when their livelihood depends on an aggressive harvest has been a difficult challenge for the fishing industry. Only by passing enforceable fishing limit laws can the reduction in fishing be achieved. If nothing is done, however, the world's fishing industry will soon suffer the fate of the Canadian cod off the coast of Nova Scotia. In the early 1990s, the effect of persistent fishing of the once great Canadian cod is held up as a global cautionary tale against fisheries mismanagement, against greedy human overfishing. Not only were the cod overfished, but their source of food, zooplankton, also mysteriously disappeared. The result was not only a scarcity of cod, but those that survive are suffering from severe malnutrition. It is an alarming discovery, one that has major implications for fish ecosystems worldwide. After a 10-year moratorium on fishing cod off the coast of Canada, the stocks have still not recovered to previous levels, and those that have survived are seriously undernourished. It would seem we are a long ways from balancing our need for fish protein with the fragile ecosystems that provide for a healthy harvest of marine life. It brings us to our fourth and final topic in our Oceans Dying episode, conservation. Are we our own worst enemy when it comes to the destruction of the world's oceans? Has our insatiable demand for seafood brought the science fiction future vision in the film Soylent Green into current day reality? Even as one species of fish after another goes on the endangered list, fishermen go after what is left because certain markets are willing to pay enormous prices for some kinds of fish. It appears that if there is only one bluefin tuna left in the sea, someone will pay a million dollars to be able to eat it. In many cases, the fish caught today are under such intense fishing pressure, they never even have the chance to reproduce. Even as fish stocks steadily dwindle, there are no signs that commercial fishing companies will voluntarily change their practices because the soaring demand for fish continues to push up prices. Fish prices, especially for prime species such as cod, haddock, and flounder, have risen as much as eight times the consumer price index over the past 20 years. Fish is rapidly becoming a luxury in so many places that the prices are rising as dramatically as the harvest is falling. This means the big fishing operations have big incentives to extract even small fish, and it enables them to invest in even more technology and more powerful boats. Clearly the situation is spiraling out of control. It's time to stop the death of the Earth's life-giving oceans. That brings us to what you can do to help reduce the impact on our ocean marine life. First, learn everything you can about what's happening with the world's marine life so that you can be an effective advocate for sustained fishing or establishing marine life preserves. Second, contact your congressional leaders and make sure they understand the issues regarding the impact of unregulated fishing on future fish populations. Third, when you go to buy fish at the store or restaurant, try to pick species that are not endangered by overfishing. Educate your friends and family members, co-workers, and church groups on the issues surrounding our dying oceans. Get initiatives passed in your state legislature to ensure marine sanctuaries and fishing limit laws are passed. Boycott any company that sells fish products that does not follow international laws on fish conservation. As the late Bob Hunter, the father of Greenpeace, put it, An eco shitstorm is coming. Everything rests upon whether or not we come to terms with the politics of earth and sky, evolution and transformation. Otherwise, in our lifetimes, we shall suffer the fall of nature itself. If we don't want to end up eating soil and green biscuits, it's time we save the oceans. Thank you.